the interruption, but here we are back at Canyon de Chez, a beautiful, beautiful location where the Anasazi built in a, in a fissure underneath a, a giant cliff wall. Just imagine millions and millions of tons of rock over top of you, hanging over you, and this is where these people lived and, and uh, prayed and, and basically created their lives in contact, in deep connection with the earth itself. And they were obviously feeling that these were sacred spaces for them. These were not just places of shelter, but places of intense power and uh, spiritual force. And so when we come to Canyon de Chez, this is really an indication of what these Anasazi people were connected to. They were deeply connected into the earth, and their houses and their spiritual uh, places of spiritual work were all enclosed in the same area. They were continuous houses. Tribes lived in kin groups, and they had places of, uh, of living, and then places of spiritual initiation and uh, efforts along those lines, as we will see. This uh, particular view is of a place called Mesa Verde, and Cliff Palace is the name they've given to this beautiful construction. The architecture is uh, obviously very uh, basic in some ways, and yet elegant. A lot of uh, solid walls with small holes it for windows and for e ventilation, but uh, very, very much connected to the planet. The planet was, for these people, a sacred being. That was from Mesa Verde. This is uh, a view of a place called Pueblo Benito from the Chaco culture of the Anasazi. And once again, you can see the significance of spiritual work for, the, for this group of individuals, these human beings. When you look at the houses, which are rectangular and uh, quite high, these were once considered to be for their time, some of the highest apartment buildings in the world, apparently. But what's more significant, I think, is the circular objects that we see in this image. All of those, the smaller and larger circles, were kivas, places of spiritual work. The smaller uh, circles represented kin group kivas, where, where the families and the extended families would do their practices together. And at certain, I guess, exalted or at least cal calendrically significant times of the year and in various cycles that they used in terms of a cal calendar, uh, the great kivas would then be used. The great kivas were for group initiations, for group efforts in the spiritual realm. And this definitely has been carried on to every to present day people in this area. So the kivas are still continuing to be used. Not these ones, but th they're, they're modern versions of them. So spirituality was a great deal, uh, was a great deal a part of everyone's life in these cultures. This is uh, a great kiva, at least the ruin of a great kiva, called Chetro Kettle at Chaco. And as you can see, there were benches around the circumference where the entire tribe could sit, or a very large number of individuals could sit, and there would be 
uh, shamanic invocation, shamanic transference of energy from the higher realm into the into the group, and in a co-participatory way, the group would create energies and force that would be transmitted back to the universe at large. So there was a uh, mutually interactive spiritual work going on in these kivas, where human beings would receive spiritual force from the universe. They would take it in, create a certain kind of prayer force or whatever force that was used, and then they would send it back up to the greater universe at large. In effect, an obligation that was cosmic in nature for humanity. And these people participated in this way with the universe. Now this is a reconstructed great Kiva at Aztec, New Mexico. And one of the functions of humanity was, of course, to become more and more conscious for a reason, for the, for the greater benefit, for the greater evolution, you might say, of the universe. And so one of these practices that was done in the great kivas was called breathing in the universe, where you would create a space of invocance. Everyone would be gathered. And the breathing would be the focus of attention for everyone. First, you would breathe in and become fully conscious just of your own local body space. Then you would extend your awareness and your consciousness to those who are directly adjacent to you. Then eventually you would become conscious of the entire circle of human beings breathing. And at a certain point, whoever the, the master initiate was, or master's initiate were, the the force would be reached, uh, a certain uh, level of force would be reached, which could then be sent back for the benefit of the greater universe. In other words, a creative force was sent back. It's very interesting that human beings in so-called primitive times were doing such incredible and conscious work for the benefit not just of themselves, not just for their own tribe, but for the benefit of the universe at large. And we can see here a kin kiva. It's a smaller kiva. You can see the uh, air ventilation systems, the fire pit. But you can also see that small or orange-sized hole called the Sipapu. And the Sipapu was prevalent in all kivas. The Sipapu represented the place of emergence. Now in these cultures, their focus was on getting to the center, going back to the center. And everything emerged from the center of the earth and outward to the, <laughs> you might say, the outside shell. And so through various journeys, uh, and various kinds of transformations, there were at least four or five different evolutions or more, uh, more uh, four or five different journeys to different levels of existence before humanity, the present day humanity, came to this level. And they arrived at this level thanks to spiritual guides. Now, of course, you can see uh, this fellow looks rather <laughs> stern. I call him the Sun Shield Shaman. This is a, a petroglyph, a pecked rock uh, artwork. The spiral is interesting in the sense it represents something that has evolutionary possibilities. It's not circular, not repeating and recurring, but is in fact growing. That's the implication, that there is growth in spiritual work, that spiritual work is an evolving process. And these people, these human beings in this part of the world, recognize that evolutionary process 
in terms of spiritual development. And as you can see, the uh, otherworldliness of these characters is everywhere. People aren't shown usually walking around as human beings. Uh, what's shown on these pieces of art almost always are individuals or entities that are not necessarily human. You know? Obviously, this one has seemingly got a helmet and antennae coming out of its head, and anyone can guess who or what that represents, but the point was that they were not human, and therefore the connection in the art was always to a realm beyond just mundane human activity. A great deal of it, anyway. There were goats in this, though. <laughs> and they're still there. But, as, as always, the important characters were part of not just a mythology, but uh, an invocational presence, a reminder for us to connect to those levels of our deeper humanity, our deeper potential as human beings. And these entities, these beings, were the ones that were most uh, represented in the art and in the way that the architecture was produced. These entities were the ones that were invoked in the kivas. This one is Kokopelli, the flute player. And the Kokopelli is versatile in this part of the world in the southwest of the United States. He has many different uh, characterizations, but he is one of, the, one of the spiritual guides that was responsible for humanity's safe journey from the previous level of existence to this one. And I suppose he would be a guide that would take us back into the other levels from which we originated as spiritual beings. Kokopelli the flute player. Some people give him the attributes of, uh, of a fertility being. He's usually portrayed with a very large male member. However, he's also a trickster. He plays the flute. He's uh, associated with uh, helping women in childbirth. But the point is, his foremost role is that of spiritual guide someone who helps us evolve. He's got a humpback, and some people c consider him to be an insect or a cicada or something similar to that, but he has an identity that is related to our deeper possibilities as human beings. And we go from the American Southwest a bit further south now. We go into the Mesoamerican areas where the oldest known culture up to this point um, are the Olmecs. The Olmecs are, are located mostly in a volcan volcanic area of uh, Veracruz. And this place is called La Venta. And these incredible colossal heads, some of them six, seven feet high, made from basalt, are indicative of the incredible craftsmanship of these people, considering that they used stone technology. They didn't use metal tools. So in order to be able to move these gigantic pieces of rock and to, to carve them with such skill, required not only a great deal of effort, but a great deal of refined craftsmanship. And obviously, these entities are not ordinary in, in any way. The entity that is most prevalent in all of Mesoamerican culture from, from the northern Mexican Chichimec tribes to almost the end of Central America is an individual named Kukulkan or Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. Now this is the Olmec version of that individual. And Kukulkan or whatever his Olmec name was 
is represented here as someone who is reclining in the coils of a serpent, but a serpent with a, a crown, almost like a feather crown. And uh, you'll see more, uh, more recent versions of Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl and uh, Kukulkan uh, soon. But this ancient version of it came, comes from that area called the Venta of the Olmecs. And uh, as you can see, there's a connection between the serpent and the human in this particular representation. And this is, in fact, the most widespread uh, form in all that culture, in the entire culture, has this individual. Now we jump ahead a couple of thousand years, and here you see it once again. You see Quetzalcoatl. This is a post-Toltec uh, settlement called Xochicalco, and this version once again has that ridge of feathers or whatever you want to say. Uh, there's feathers on the on the back end of it. The, the feathers represent, of course, ascension. Something that crawls, something that's connected to the earth is able to fly, to lift off, to go beyond its original form. And this is what Quetzalcoatl, re Quetzalcoatl really represents. Quetzalcoatl was a spiritual being who came to these people and established all the great teachings about religion, science, art, about building, everything that those people could um, call a civilization are, is credited either to Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan. And he is, in fact, a, a divinity who has landed in human form to teach humans how to evolve, how to transcend their primary coatl, their snake, their, their DNA, if you will, to, to evolve their DNA, to spiritualize it, and to turn into something greater than they started with. Once again, now that was Quetzalcoatl, this is Kukulkan. This is the Mayan version of the same individual. And in this one, take note, please, if you can see it. I'm not sure on a small screen, but... Right there, coming out of the jaws of the serpent. Coming out of the jaws of the serpent is the human. In other words, the human is shedding the snake skin, in a sense. It's coming out and emerging out of that primary form. The DNA is evolving into something higher. And here's another picture of that. You can see there is the head. Above and below are the jaws of the serpent. And he's exiting out of it. He's coming out of that form. An interesting aspect of the religious and spiritual um, sensibilities of these people, the, the Mesoamerican cultures, is the interchangeability of the god forms. Gods were not solidified into one particular aspect. They would shift and change into each other and back again. So you have Quetzalcoatl and Chak and the ancient god, the, the old one with the missing teeth. All of these were then basically masks for the same underlying reality. And there was actually an understanding that beyond the conceivable and perceivable forms of higher consciousness or whatever the highest possible form of understanding about creation and creator creators was, that there was something beyond all these masks that there was an underlying beingness that unified everything, that was present in everything, you know, the one who was near and far, the one that was nearer than near and farther than far. 
it was an entity that might be attributed to more modern versions of things like uh, an absolute. But obviously the masks were interchangeable and removable in terms of their spiritual traditions. And here we have, once again, an, entity, an individual, a carving from the Maya, where the, the human being has had his head replaced by a bunch of intertwined serpents. Some would term it a form of sacrifice, but this could also be, if you looked at it carefully, uh, a form of wisdom, because the serpent, the snake, was one of the main motifs, as was the jaguar. The jaguar represented power. The serpent, the snake, represented wisdom, as in so many other cultures around the world. And so this could also represent someone who has, in fact, accessed seven different streams of wisdom. And so this would be an initiate of very high order. You know, to be given this kind of an abstract form is possibly the only way that it could be given. Someone who has given of themselves completely to the universe receives in, in return all the wisdoms connected to that real sacrifice, the sacrifice of giving totally of oneself. Making sacred, in other words. Sacrifice is not about losing things and giving things up. It's about realizing the sacredness of everything. And uh, therefore, the sacrifice, the sacrificing is making everything sacred. Or seeing it as what it truly is, which is sacred. Now we come to uh, a, a ground plan of the great temple complex at uh, Teotihuacan. The Teotihuacan culture preceded the Toltecs and the Aztecs of the central plains of Mexico, around Mexico City and north of it. And this was probably one of the most uh, populous and developed cultures of the continent, Teotihuacan. And they built these incredible, incredible pyramids, as you can see. This is the pyra Pyramid of the Moon with multiple levels, each representing, no doubt, a level of spiritual attainment. They didn't do these things accidentally. If there were four levels, that meant that there were four levels of attainment, four levels of development that one needed to achieve before one could r realize the top of the pyramid. And the interesting thing about Teotihuacan is it translates into two different things simultaneously. It's from the Nahua language, Nahuatl, and it says, the word means the place where the gods come to earth, where divinity comes to earth, but at the same time, it's the place where men or man becomes divinity, where men become gods. So this is a, a point of interchange between what's on earth, what is human, and what is divine, what is transcendent of human. And in effect, these pyramids are another representation of Quetzalcoatl, that the purpose of humanity is not only to, to you might say, give reverence to divinity, but also to become divine and return. So there's there's not just uh, a going away, like you, you ascend forever into the spiritual realms and you don't return. There's a, there's a give and a take. There's a flow between the transcendent realms, the, the realms of, and dimensions beyond human life, and that which is beyond human life returns as well. It comes back to Earth, and the point would be to make what's here on Earth divine, to make the ground on which you stand both divinity and humanity. This is the so-called <laughs> path of the dead. But in fact, all these temple platforms were used for s spiritual work 
at certain times, and the calendar was incredibly important. Time was very important in, in these cultures, and we'll get into that a bit later. So this is the way of the dead, so-called, and this is the other great pyramid at Teotihuacan, the Pyramid of the Sun. And as you can see, these are definite levels. And when you attain the summit of this pyramid, you have gotten to that point, that portal, if you will, where it would be possible to transcend the human life. And in, in terms of coming down, you once you received the elixir of immortality, or whatever you would like to call it, you would come down and give it back to those who are here at these other levels, so-called. And of course, at the end of this great way is the temple dedicated to the power entity in this culture named Tlaloc and Quetzalcoatl, the winged serpent. So, so power and evolutionary force in one temple, in one location, the power to transcend the humanity and then to bring back that transcendence to this level as well. Now we go to Tikal, which is in Guatemala, and this is one of the largest temple centers, uh, spiritual initiation centers of this group of people. And as you can see, there are a lot of high pyramids in here related to that very specific aim of transcending the human and stabilizing that divine impulse, that divine potential, and then returning. Someone mentioned that the idea was you walked up the steps but never returned. That may be true, but I think even more difficult would be coming down, or just as difficult as going up the steps and realizing that highest point would be then returning back down to that level that you started from. So this is the temple, temple of the Jaguar, as a matter of fact. And as you can see, it's very high. These are as high as some of the pyramids of Egypt. And then we go from Tikal to the beautiful palace compound of Palenque. And here we will meet probably the most famous Mayan individual. Uh, this is his palace. This is the palace of Pakel and all that, the lineage of all the priest kings of the Maya that lived in this location. But Pakal is especially well known to everyone through various uh, documentaries and so forth about the Maya. His uh, sarcophagus was found in this pyramid, stepped pyramid construction with a temple on top which also happens to have a huge <laughs> date for the universe in it. It's older than the actual, <laughs> na uh, uh, it's older than the actual known scientific age of the universe at this point. The number is bigger than that in terms of time. And inside this pyramid, you would find the, uh, the sarcophagus lid and what was once there was the sarcophagus of Pakal the Great call the cosmic voyager and in this drawing you can see Pakal suspended between two different realities the tree of life is the conveyor this is the so-called earth entity it could also be it's basically the power of, of all the elements and here is Kuku Khan representing the, the Kuku bird on top of that, that tree of life awaiting the voyager to ascend at the moment of death to the topmost part of the tree. But here Pakal is suspended. 
and some people have suggested this is a picture of an ancient astronaut. Could be, or it could be someone who's definitely a higher dimensional voyager going on a voyage that transcends life and death and I think would actually be even more meaningful than just being someone who voyages into outer space and back. It would mean someone who has transcended the phenomenon or the, um, the principle of having to die and then be born. So, Pakal Bhutan, very famous Mayan priest, king, on his cosmic voyage into the great beyond. But the architecture that was created to house all these artifacts and art was in fact very straightforward and this is called a corbelled vault, a Mayan corbelled vault. Now corbelling is basically a series of steps that go up to the top but they're all based on gravity. There are big blocks that are put on smaller blocks, or yeah, on the blocks below, and so forth. And they stick out a little bit, and as you go, you get the curve. But it's not really a curved vault in, or arch in the true sense that there isn't any dynamic tension between the pieces as they progress upward. Rather, it's all based on gravity and the, the weight of all the stones pushing down on everything else below them. There's no real dynamic tension there in the, the arch itself. And we'll go into that here a little bit later. But now we've got the incredible Pyramid of the Magician at Ushmal. The Pyramid of the Ma Magician has probably some of the steepest steps, as you'll see, of any of the, the pyramids. And I think there was a real reason. When we talk about conscious architecture and car conscious art, that art and architecture has a conscious effect on you as you're interacting with it, as you're seeing it. And anyone who's been in the presence of this uh, amazing work will attest to the fact that the, the force, the presence of something like this in the middle of a jungle is, is awe-inspiring, but not only awe-inspiring, you can see that it's above the jungle. Yeah, it's above mundane life, life on the ground, even life in the trees. It's above all that. It's ascending towards something that transcends Earth itself, life on Earth itself. And yet, it's part of our humanity, the Quetzalcoatl. And let's take a look. Now we can see what I was talking about earlier. Here is the staircase that you have to climb. And anyone who's attempted it will know that it is indeed an incredibly steep climb. You need real attention to climb this staircase. And the priests, initiates who climb these steps to do their spiritual work in the temple above, above all had to have genuine focus, genuine balance, and a real purpose for doing so. Nowadays tourists nowadays tourists will climb up this these steps with the aid of a, a chain that's uh, on on the steps but uh, obviously that was not the function of these steps. And when you see why they built these so steep or or when you see that they built these uh, steps that steeply, you will know that these were intended to be a way of reminding one to stay awake and pay attention right here, right now. Well, go there, go to Ushmal, and walk those steps, and you will see what I mean. And of course, here's the observatory. Now, the observatory, as it's been called, actually was used as an observatory for sightings of Venus, which was related to Quetzalcoatl, to Kukulkan. And the, and the cycle of time was very important in these cultures because humanity was thought to be a direct contributor to the existence of the universe, to the cosmos. And we'll get into that in a little while. Now we get to see the plan of Chichen Itza. 
Chichen Itza is, of course, probably the most famous Mexican pyramid, along with the Teotihuacan Great Pyramids. And here it is. This pyramid has 91 steps going from the four directions, which makes 364. The 365th step is the top level with the temple on top. And this represented the completion of a solar year, at which time they did very specific uh, emanating and uh, upward directing types of work to uh, help sustain the universe. And we'll get into the true, I think, the real nature of what that was originally and not what most people hear about nowadays, about what the Maya did with sacrifice and so forth. This is a totally different kind of giving, a totally different kind of effort that we're going to be discussing shortly. And here we get into the, the, an equally beautiful pyramid structure, complex actually, called El Tijin. Now El Tijin uh, is um, somewhat north, I guess it's in the, on the coast of, of the Gulf of Mexico almost, very close to the Olmec, the ancient Olmec sites. And these people created an incredible complex, and they were thought to be sort of Mayan colonists that created their own subculture. But in this particular image, you see the Pyramid of the Niches. Now, the Pyramid of the Niches has 365 of these little alcoves. And in these alcoves, in each of those was an individual day deity, like a, a god form for a, a particular day. But it wasn't just for a particular day. These represented scales of time from the smallest to the largest. And these deities carried a certain parcel packet of time, from very small packets to the, the most immense ones. And so these represented a, a year in the life of this group, but also of the world, of the universe. And so the, bur the carrying of time, these time carriers represented something quite unique to this culture, because they would actually become sacred uh, vessels of being responsible, let's say, for one minute, for one day, for one year, for a hundred years, for a thousand years. Each of these individual God forms would then would be carrying a certain amount of time. And whatever was contained in that time frame, within that packet of time, within that volume of time, was an eternal being. And each eternal being would carry from, the, like I say, it's from micro time to macro time and everything in between. And these would be represented in these different God forms of time carriers. Think about that, if you will that you carry and are responsible for being fully conscious of a certain amount of time. And then we come to the Aztec sunstone, actually the creation cycle of the different suns. And many people have gone through this. But the point being here, that this particular cycle, there have been four other suns, the fifth sun, as, we, as it's called now, the one we see shining down on us every day, was generated by a force known as four motion. Motion, everything is in motion in this universe. And in order to create and sustain the motion of the universe, certain kinds of effort certain kinds of uh, real human work were required. Now, they called this the heart sacrifice. 
uh, some people called it the heart sacrifice, but I'm going to give you a more esoteric version of it because there is a tradition, ancient as it is, but and very much unknown, and the only person who actually exposed it was a was a wonderful woman named Irene Nicholson. And sh unfortunately, she's passed away now, over 45 years ago, in the late 1960s. But the point is, she presented the idea of the deified heart, a heart that you created out of your ordinary human heart through your conscious efforts, through all the different trials and uh, challenges, you spiritualized your heart until it became not just ordinary, not just a beating organ made of flesh and blood, but something that transcended physicality. And this deified heart, this deified heart, which would have a corresponding real face connected to it, in other words, the the divinity of the heart would in itself uh, ex be expressed through the the light of the face, the truth of the face, the undividedness of the face, the, yeah, the unified being of the face. That divine heart would be seen through that face. And the real face and the deified heart were the tradition from which the great heart sacrifice originated. And this heart, this deified heart, was the heart that you sacrificed, that you gave up to the greater universe, not just the sun, but everything that would make everything continue, not just in a mechanical way, but in a conscious evolution sort of way. In other words, you were contributing. You were contributing to the evolving conscious life of the universe through giving up this deified heart. And this was of humanity, to give this deified, this heart that was more than what you came here with originally. You gave this up to the universe, and this universe, in response, in reflex, would give back from above a higher conscious impulse for those who were here. So, once again, this interchange, the Quetzalcoatl, the rising above the DNA, the, the serpent form of the, the helix, going up above that to the transcendent realm, and the transcendent realm responding, co-responding. So it was a co-creative act, both from below to above and from above to below. You only, be, you only realize the deified heart through being open to higher impulses. And then once that was fully stabilized, a critical mass was reached in terms of the deified heart, the divinity of the, the so-called substance, if you want. But the realness of that would then be given back to the universe. And that would be what would create the motion that would evolve everything in the universe, the deified heart. And so once again, we come to, and one more thing about the uh, Mesoamerican cultures you can see here is that this is an Aztec temple at Tenayuca, which is just north of, um, in, in northern Mexico City. Mexico City is so gigantic that it's, I guess, now one of the outskirts. But Tenayuca, you can see at the top there, the pyramid platform started small. Every 52 years, a new fire ceremony would be performed, and then they would build on top of the original pyramid. And each step, each uh, renewal of the universe, as it were, would, pre be, would have another layer of the temple added to it. And so these different uh, layers, uh, preceding stages, can be seen in, in some of the ruins because you can see them going back 13, 14, even further. How many times they performed this renewal ceremony where they rebuilt the temple 
on the foundation of the, of the previous one. So each step up was taken definitively and pragmatically by s putting it on top of the previous level. And so you can see this. So very grounded. This culture was very grounded, and yet they were aspiring to reach beyond into the infinite. And so here's the, a model of it, if you will. And probably, once again, Quetzalcoatl and Tlaloc. You know, power and wisdom together. Power and wisdom. So you need the power in order to actuali actualize things, but you need the wisdom in order to make things flow harmoniously so that they will endure. And here's the uh, existing edifice now, as you can see it. It's been somewhat ruined, but it's one of the few Aztec temples still remaining. And these are the Coatipantli, the serpent guardians around the foot of the pyramid. And you can look at them as either sinister or something else. They were, they were uh, given the attribute of uh, sacrifice, certain kinds of sacrifice. But if you, if you look at sacrifice not as some kind of, kind of violent and forceful act, but as, as, a, as a voluntary giving, a voluntary giving of everything, so that even you become nothing. And then, if there's anything else that can happen, it'll be given. You have to be totally empty in, or, in order to receive. So these serpent guardians maybe represent all the different wisdoms needed in order to ascend. All those helping um, efforts required, conscious efforts, intentional uh, enduring of difficult situations that would allow you to ascend consciously, to evolve consciously. Now, this is the mother of the gods, Coatlique, the Aztec mother of the gods. And uh, we're going to get into a, a little uh, uh, musical interlude shortly, but in the meantime, uh, Coatlique gave birth to, you might say, the forces that make life dynamic. And in these, you'll see why. Tuscatlapoca and Quetzalcoatl were kind of like, uh, Tuscatlapoca represented kind of a chaotic, the chaotic uh, disruptive forces that could happen, and Quetzalcoatl, the ordering progression force in reality. And so these two forces came from the, that divine mother figure who represents the ultimate sacrifice in a sense of giving everything, nourishing everything. She's both the creator and the, and the destroyer, very much like the, uh, the Kali Durga images in Hindu spirituality. So we go beyond Tezcatlipoca and Quetzalcoatl, and you see this is a kind of a, a unique representation of wisdom because there's ordinary, you might say, everyday reality, understanding, wisdom, and then there's transcendent. And yet they're part of the same body. They're, they have the same body. They are of the same source. Interestingly enough, you'll remember those lines in the original Paleolithic carving that we saw in those ancient caves. And once again, Quetzalcoatl emerging out of the jaws of the serpent. The higher human being, the higher potential, lies within the, the casing of flesh and blood and DNA, ready to ascend. And here we come to the Toltec, former Toltec center, Tula. And you have forms of Quetzalcoatl, Ehecatl, who is the uh, manifestation of the divine breath, the breath that put everything into motion. 
And these are the guardians, the upholders of spiritual evolution. They're looking, apparently, <laughs> I think they're looking to the east. And they're looking toward Quetzalcoatl as the morning star, the herald of enlightenment for all that are here on Earth. And I think that ends our little sojourn for this segment of the Architects of Conscious Transformation. Now we're going to pause for just a few seconds, and we're going to have a little bit of a musical interlude with Deborah Judith about these images and about what they represent. So thank you for uh, watching, and here comes Deborah Judith.
thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week, 7.30. We hope that was useful. This has been the Architects of Conscious Transformation. Good night.